Hello, and welcome to the, to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. This time we're finally getting back to regular issues of Nintendo Power with issue 25 for June of 1991. As always, there's a lot of ground to cover this issue, so let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Battletoads, and this isn't a good-looking cover. There's no real sense of perspective on the characters, and no context to the scene, making it very cluttered. I don't talk about the house ads very much, but the one this issue is worth mentioning. After our strategy guide issues in year two, we're now getting a second wave of strategy guides in the magazine's fourth year. These guides are the game Atlas and some designated Mario, Game Boy, and Super NES guides. As yet, we have no cover art for these books yet, so this is definitely a these things are coming later, look forward to it ad, as opposed to a buy them now on your local newsstand, bookstore, whatever ad, or fill out a mail order form. I may have to cover these in the future. I'll have to take a look at them and see how much of the material in there is redundant. I also normally don't cover the editorial columns. They usually just rehash information on the facing table of contents. But this issue marks the departure of Howard Phillips for LucasArts, so it bears mentioning here. With, in our letters column this issue, we get letters from readers whose pets are interested in video games and like to watch their owners play them. Well, might as well share my own story. Uh, my cats like to sit on my lap and shoulders while I'm playing video games. You, For those of you viewers who have watched my Let's Play Remember Me may remember me discussing in the video, no pun intended, that my gameplay was being affected by having a cat on my shoulders. Getting started with the actual game content, we have a strategy guide for our cover game, Battletoads. The guide has maps for each of the game levels, prior to the final boss fight against the Dark Queen. This guide unfortunately doesn't have any timing information for the jet bike sequences, which would have been really useful. Additionally, the guide is interspersed with a continuation of the Battletoads comic strip from a few issues back. The comic warps and violates the fourth wall with all the reckless abandon of a Chuck Jones short. Though it's not necessarily, though it's not as funny as a Chuck Jones short. Battletoads is a notoriously hard game, and one which I've occasionally described as being one of the bad hard variety. But the good hard variety. Now, having revisited it for this episode, it is bad hard, but it's... If I was to put on a grading curve, or grading scale, letter grade, I'd give it like a C minus D plus. The game's brawler levels are well done. They're not exactly imaginative, well, aside from the enemy designs, but they have interesting boss fights, the controls are solid, and managing the number of opponents on screen is a challenge, but not a impossible one. Where problems come up are the racing levels and the snake levels, which both require a considerable amount of memorization. To be specific, these levels start off with initially, um, speeds that are fast enough that the player's reflexes are tested, but a player with impaired reflexes due to disability or age could still clear the obstacles if they were paying attention. However, things just keep getting faster and faster to the point where the game goes from Dark Souls, you need to pay attention difficulty, to Ninja Gaiden, rote memorization and muscle memory difficulty. As I stated way back in Ninja Gaiden, a game like this works fine with some of the handicaps that emulation and cheat devices can grant, and if this game had unlimited continues, I would cut it some slack for this. However, as it stands, this game, for an inexplicable reason, has limited continues, specifically around 5. As I've also stated before, this is a home console game, and if I had bought this game new on release, I probably would have spent about $30 to $40 for a copy of this game. Assuming 50 cents per credit, reasonable amount for an arcade, I'd expect about 60 continues before I have to start the game over from the beginning. Which at which point you might as well just make it infinite. So the idea of putting limited continues for a game that's having a home console release, which at this point had not gotten an arcade release, seems kind of baffling. So next we have our SNES preview. The SNES is coming and the staff of the Nintendo Power would like you to get hyped. We have photographs of the system along with descriptions of the specifications and stills of a few games. 
having been playing a bunch of NES games for this show, seeing the transition from the SNES to the or the, the NES to the SNES is very striking, and I can now come understand the wow factor with moving up to 16-bit during this period. It really does feel like an arcade, like a, a of the time arcade machine in your home. It's not totally up to snuff, of course. I mean, Final Fight had three characters, but the home version only had two. But still, it is a truly striking transition in a lot of ways. We also have in this article some concept art for rejected designs for the SNES. Two of the designs appear to have the user load cartridges horizontally, like in the NES, but without the VCR-style design where you're pushing down on it, much as the VHS tape would go into your VCR and then be lowered down by the mechanism. While the third design has the user loading cards vertically, as you would have in the final model, but it appears to have you loading the cartridges at a 45-degree forward-facing angle, which is a, a interesting design choice. Moving on to our next game, we have NES Open Tournament Golf, another golf game from Nintendo. Aside from descriptions of the game's clubs and interface, the magazine's guide out includes a fold-out poster with maps of all 18 holes for each of the game's courses. As I mentioned last episode, I enjoy playing golf. I also suck at golf. I found myself faring better in terms to 8-bit console golf games with NES Open Tournament Golf. Um, in part because the game has, for lack of a better term, a caddy system, where the game examines the maximum range of each of the clubs, which is hard programmed in, and selects a club which they deal for the distance you're shooting. It's a pretty good system, though it does have its problems. If you're immediately adjacent to the green, but still technically in the rough, the game re recommends a sand wedge when really you're better off just using a putter. Otherwise, this is a very solid golf game. The game lets you create a profile and save your stats to the profile so you can see how well you perform over time. And because this game has three full courses to play, it provides a very good amount of replay value. And by comparison, a lot of PC golf games at this time basically shipped with like three or four golf courses and then you'd buy additional courses through expansions. I definitely consider this game to be an entertaining way to spend an afternoon, even in two-player. Moving into the Game Boy section, we have The Hunt for Red October. This is a game adaptation of the film, turning it into what is basically a submarine shooter. The game has single-player and two-player modes, with the two-player mode putting one player in control of the Red October against the other player controlling the Russian Navy. The single-player mode also takes you, th uh, takes you through eight more conventional shoot-em-up stages, and the guide gives maps for each stage. This is not a well-put-together shooter. The concept behind the game's single-player levels is novel. You make your way through the game from left to right with the ability to backtrack to the level you to fit, while evading bombardment from surface warships and other submarines. This could work. I mean, in particular, just being able to go in the other direction is something that a lot of shooters of this time didn't do. In fact, the last shooter I can think of that really made it the thing, for a spaceship or otherwise, is Defender. The problem is, this game doesn't handle shooting well. You have enemy submarines and warships with foaming shots, and apparently unlimited ones, or effectively unlimited ones. And you can't particularly dodge them due to the tight confines. You, on the other hand, have a limited number of foaming shots, which will kill enemy subs in one hit, but you're still limited. So you can't just go, oh, there's enemy sub, I'll hit the homing shot, and try to hit it in a situation where the enemy hasn't fired on you yet, and you can take them out before they've shot first. You have unlimited normal shots, but they go in a straight line and take multiple shots to kill enemies, while they can get multiple shots in on you while you try to take them out. Now, if enemy subs went down like normal enemies in the shooter, where like one or two hits drops them, it'd be fine. But because these enemies are torpedo sponges, that means you will end up taking multiple cheap hits. While there are health refill power-ups throughout the levels and extra lives, you're, to a certain degree, risking taking additional damage to get the health refill to repair the damage that you took getting to that point. And then you take a whole bunch of damage before you get to where you can find another health refill 
potentially taking more damage when you spotted it to make the adjustments to get to that health level. It's, it's a vicious cycle which leads to some unfair gameplay. I recommend giving this game a miss. Next is Fortified Zone from Jellico, a maze-based run-and-gun game for the Game Boy. We have maps for every level in the game. Fortified Zone is a very interesting game. It's a top-down, exploration-based studio with kind of maze-based design. And the game lets you switch between two characters, Masato and Mizuki. Mizuki can use the standard gun, but only the standard gun, but can jump along where you more easily access some areas of the map, while Masato can use sub-weapons that make him a better choice against boss fights and harder enemies. Now you start the game with only one life per character, but you can find additional health packs that will restore your health, and if your health is already full, that med pack will be stored, effectively serving as an extra life. If the active character dies and you have no med packs in storage, you'll switch to the other character. From there, when you get a med pack in storage, you then have to go back to the room where the other character died and resurrect the other character. Additionally, as you make your way through the game's levels, there are power-ups that will extend your life bar, boost your gun to shot, in addition to sub-weapons that will let you deal more damage. So the game becomes about navigating the game's levels, finding the necessary power-ups, and reaching the boss while managing which character you're using to handle the amount of health for each character so you can navigate the various hazards along the way. But ideally, what you want to do is you want to have Masato face the boss with full health and a full set of ammo for a sub-weapon so he can deal a bunch of damage really fast early on. However, you also need to keep Mizuki alive because there are hard-to-access areas with sub-weapons and health upgrades that you need to have her to you to access. It's a nice little bit of strategy there, and I really like that. That said, my main problem with this game is that the screen is just too small for this type of gameplay. Um, in terms of the size of sprites compared to the enemies on screen, I do like the, that the sprites provide a fair amount of character for each of the um, multiple characters. They're each has their own distinct look, distinct move animations, but it's difficult kind of navigating them on screen in a way that will allow you to see what's going on and not get hit. It feels like this game would work better with the larger screen resolution larger screen resolution of the NES or the Super NES compared to the small Game Boy screen. Fortunately, we'll hopefully get to revisit this franchise later with Operation Logic Bomb, a Super Nintendo game, and that version will hopefully turn out better. Finishing up the Game Boy titles, we have a port of RC Pro-Am for the Game Boy, or rather, expanded version for the Game Boy. We don't get track maps for the game, but we do get notes for eight of the game's 24 tracks. So, here's the thing about rubber banding AI in racing games. Rubber band AI, done properly, will create situations where the player can never get so far behind that they can't win with sufficient skill, but they will also have a challenge. With Super RC Pro-Am, I wish this game had rubber band AI in any form. My first race was a blowout. The next couple races were a little closer, and then I hit around track 4 or 5, where, to provide difficulty, the track was strewn with oil slicks. The opposing racers were able to avoid them without too many problems, while I hit just enough of them that I was so far behind that I couldn't proceed. This wasn't fun, it was just frustrating. That said, graphics and gameplay-wise, Super RC Pro-Am could have been a perfect port of RC Pro-Am. The camera perspective gives enough space for the character player to plan their next move, while also allowing them to differentiate their car from other cars. And it even puts enough room on screen that they also have able to put a mini-map on there so that the player can anticipate future turns in the course. Controls are smooth enough, enough that I didn't have any problems navigating some of the more conventional tracks. The moment, however, where they decided to dump a bunch of oil on the track and call that a challenge, things went right downhill. It's like Rare felt that the way to port RC Pro-Am to portable systems was to make the portable system, portable version a more cheaply hard sequel to the original game. Considering that the Game Boy had a wider install base than the NES, that was a really bad idea. Skip this game. We've now come to the final installment of Howard and Nestor, where the duo takes on the Lone Ranger. The tip is pretty weak, which is kind of a bummer, but I suspect this game was picked so they can set up having Howard entrusting his bow tie 
to Nestor before literally riding off into the sunset. Returning to NES titles, we now have the maze-based adventure game Day Dreamin' Davy. The game gives maps of the first three areas in the game, and notes in the following seven levels. Day Dreamin' Davy's art style is really bad! Really bad! This is some of the worst cutscene art I've seen in the NES. Further, its gameplay is clunky and boring. I enjoy games that reward exploration. I enjoy maze games. I love Fortified Zone. But this game is a mess. The first level of this game is basically just a maze with lots of enemies that will do damage to you, but you can't hit. And the next level is basically a kind of arbitrary item hunt until you have enough stuff to buy a gun so you can take out the boss. If this game had a mix of like Zelda, Willow, or Ease style fantasy gameplay in the fantasy sections and some Gunsmoke style run and gun gameplay in the western sequences, for example, this would be probably a more enjoyable game. Instead, this game is, at best, boring, and frankly, being boring is a game's worst possible sin. In classified information, readers of Nintendo Power have cracked the password system in Mega Man 3 in its entirety, and we get details on how it works. In the Now Playing column, we have Super Spy Hunter, which will probably be covered in the future, since the game appears on the, as the poster on the flip side of the fold-out maps for NES Open Tournament Golf. We also have information on the new RPG called Ferris, which I also hope I get to cover. In Counselor's Corner, we get a bunch of we get, uh, a bunch of tips for The Simpsons, Bart vs. the Space Mutants. And considering the gameplay on that game, I suspect the Counselor's hot guy is get, Hotline is getting a whole slew of calls about that game. Entering the top 30 this issue, in terms of games we haven't reviewed yet, is Double Dragon 3 and Bandit Kings of Ancient China. Our celebrity profile this issue is a pro profile of David Leisure, star of the sitcom Empty Nest. Um, he'd also been doing a whole bunch of commercials for Isuzu at the time that this profile came out. As far as what he's been doing now, well, after doing about 10 years worth of soap opera work, no exaggeration, he's now been doing a few independent films, so hey, more power to him. In Pack Watch, Pack Watch on the upcoming title front, we have a NES port of Sid Meier's Pirates. This issue is pretty single-player focused, and the two-player games on here aren't that great. So only one picked this issue, and it kind of fits for both two-player and one-player. Um, and that is NES Open Tournament Golf for the NES. Um, as far as Game Boy titles go, maybe Fortified Zone? If you, if you were to pick up one Game Boy title off the list, yeah. Also, um, it's 24 years late, but still, uh, we bid a fond farewell to Howard Phillips, and with it the Howard and Nestor comic strip. Next time, we begin a Howard and nestor list Nintendo Power with issue number 26, and with it, a title game that was not actually out yet as of the release of that issue. So, see you next time.